Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of James Craig? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the alleged crime, then offer my analysis. James Tolliver Craig was born on February 11, 1978. He went by the name Jim. From 2002 to 2006, Jim went to dental school in Missouri. After this, he started practicing as a dentist in Aurora, Colorado, which is just east of Denver. Jim worked at the Summerbrook Dental Group. Sometime around 2007, he married a woman named Angela Craig. She was just over a year younger than he was. They would go on to have six children. The family lived in a house in Aurora. In 2021, Jim filed for bankruptcy. In August of 2022, another dentist named Ryan Redfern purchased the dental practice, but Jim still worked there. Apparently, Jim was in a bad financial situation. Ryan and Jim had gone to dental school together and had known each other for about 20 years. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. Here's what happened according to an arrest warrant filed on March 20, 2023 by the Aurora Police Department. Jim's relationship with Angela was deteriorating. They had some rough times in their marriage. For example, sometime around 2017 or 2018, Jim drugged Angela. There was talk of divorce. On February 27, 2023, Jim used a computer in the dental office that he typically did not use. He logged in with an email account that had been created recently. He never used this email on any other device. Jim searched, quote, how many grams of pure arsenic will kill a human, unquote, and, quote, is arsenic detectable in autopsy, unquote. He also searched for chemical suppliers in Aurora and placed an order from Amazon. The product he ordered was arsenic metal, 99.99%. 99%. On March 1, Jim and Angela sent text messages back and forth. Their communication was consistent with Angela being open to fixing their marriage. On March 4, the arsenic that Jim had ordered from Amazon arrived at his residence. The next day, Angela returned home from a trip to Utah. On March 6, Angela became sick after drinking a protein shake or pre-workout shake supplied to her by her husband Jim. He took her to the hospital. Angela said she was feeling dizzy, her eyes were not focusing, and her head felt funny. She was released the same day. At one point during a text message conversation between the couple, Angela wrote, I feel drugged. Jim responded, given our history, I know that must be triggering. Just for the record, I didn't drug you. On March 9, Angela went back to the hospital. The same day, Jim ordered potassium cyanide from a company called Midland Scientific. The company required James to state why he needed the chemical. He said that he was a surgeon performing a craniofacial reconstruction and would use the chemical to electroplate over medical prosthesis. If it was successful, he was going to write an article and get it published. The company eventually agreed to sell Jim the potassium cyanide after he fought tooth and nail for the chemical on March 11, James contacted his dental office and told an office assistant that a personal package would be arriving at the office. He instructed her not to open it. The package of potassium cyanide was shipped on March 13, later than Jim had hoped for. He had been vigorously trying to get it sent earlier. From Jim's perspective, this whole shipping debacle was long in the tooth. Even though Jim did not want the package opened at the dental practice, his warning proved toothless. The package was opened by another employee. She repackaged it so that Jim would not know it had been opened. At some point, Jim's business partner, Ryan, found out about the potassium cyanide. Ryan knew that Jim had no use for that chemical. Angela was released from the hospital on March 14. On March 15, she went back to the hospital at 11.08 a.m. She reported dizziness and a severe headache. As Angela's condition deteriorated, medical providers could not identify what was causing her symptoms. 
around 2 p.m., Angela suffered a seizure and was eventually placed on life support. She would never wake up. Jim's business partner, Ryan, went to the hospital. He told a nurse that he was worried Angela may have been poisoned. Ryan explained how Jim had recently ordered potassium cyanide for the dental practice, but there was no medical reason for a dental practice to have that chemical. The nurse contacted the authorities. The police rapidly launched an investigation and executed search warrants. They found the suspicious computer activity. They discovered that Jim was having an affair and even visited his lover while Angela was sick. And they learned that he ordered a poisonous flowering shrub called oleander on March 6. The police intercepted the poison before it was delivered. So Jim had ordered arsenic, potassium cyanide, and oleander during his alleged criminal adventure. On March 18, at 4.29 p.m., Angela Craig was pronounced brain dead. On March 19, Jim Craig was arrested on suspicion of first-degree murder. Now moving to my analysis. At the time making this video, Jim Craig enjoys the presumption of innocence, but of course the state of Colorado believes he's guilty of murder. Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Jim was guilty of murdering Angela. Starting with the inculpatory factors. Jim and Angela had a rocky marriage that was affected by infidelity. Jim allegedly had several affairs during his marriage and was actively having an affair when his wife died. He even spent time with his lover as Angela was dying. Allegedly, Jim had drugged Angela several years earlier. He had made an apparent reference to that in a text message. Jim created a new email account and made suspicious searches on a computer he did not typically use. The searches specifically mentioned arsenic, and Jim placed an order for arsenic. Two days after the arsenic arrived at Jim's home, Angela reported symptoms consistent with arsenic poisoning. Jim could have easily poisoned her by putting the arsenic in shakes that he prepared for her. When Angela did not die, Jim ordered potassium cyanide. There was absolutely no reason for him to have this chemical. He lied about why he needed it, and he seemed incredibly eager to get it. If Jim had a legitimate reason for the chemical, why did he tell an office assistant not to open the personal package? After Ryan found out about the potassium cyanide, Jim acted like Angela was the one who requested it. He said it was similar to playing a game of chicken. He was implying that Angela was thinking about bringing an end to her own life, and to test her resolve, he purchased the potassium cyanide. There is no evidence that Angela was considering a drastic move like that. In addition to arsenic and potassium cyanide, Jim ordered oleander. Angela died under suspicious circumstances. The symptoms that she suffered from were consistent with potassium cyanide poisoning. Through text messages, Jim attempted to persuade Ryan not to talk to anyone, including the police, presumably referring to the potassium cyanide situation of which Ryan had become aware. Moving to the exculpatory factors, Technically, Angela could have administered the arsenic and the potassium cyanide to herself. There were no witnesses to the poisoning, no video. Jim was engaged in unfaithful behavior. Perhaps somebody like a lover or jealous husband killed Angela to get revenge. That's pretty much it for exculpatory evidence. When considering all the evidence available in this case at this time, do I think that Jim Craig is guilty of murder? Yes, I think he's probably guilty. But as I mentioned, he has the presumption of innocence, and we will have to wait to see what happens at his trial. Moving to the next section, here are a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. What is a potential personality profile for Jim Craig? Jim has been described in many different ways, not all of which are consistent. For example, his employees thought of him as generous to a fault, pleasant, friendly, and upbeat. Others viewed him as a risk-taker, who was addicted to adults-only videos. And based on his behavior toward his wife, one could make an argument that he was sadistic and cruel. Jim's personality is a bit of a mystery. He appeared to have personality traits that facilitated getting through dental school and initially being successful, yet at the same time, he was impulsive and went bankrupt. This leads to two possibilities. Either Jim had an unusual personality profile or his attitudes and behaviors changed at some point during his life. 
I think the first possibility is the most likely, as personality usually does not change too much throughout a person's lifetime. Jim had an interesting profile that contained enough conscientiousness to get on track for success, but not enough to maintain success. He was agreeable enough to be perceived as altruistic, yet allegedly committed a particularly sadistic homicide. And his neuroticism was low enough to function as a dentist, but high enough to be unable to resist temptation. With all this in mind, here is a potential personality profile. Jim could have mid-range openness to experience, low conscientiousness, high extroversion, including sensation-seeking and gregariousness, mid-range to low agreeableness, although he was somewhat altruistic, and mid-range neuroticism, with a few extreme facet scores, both high and low. Item number two is the sadistic nature of Jim Craig. During the text message conversations with Angela, when she was ill from poisoning, Jim kept saying things like he was sorry and he hoped she would feel better. He pretended to be compassionate and caring. Angela did not want Jim to worry about her. She was feeling guilty about taking up all his time and energy. Angela was suffering from a number of symptoms, including headache, fatigue, shakiness, and dizziness. She clearly felt awful, yet she was still concerned for her husband, Jim. When Angela was in the hospital, she thanked Jim for spending so much time with her there. There is something particularly sadistic about Jim's behavior, if he was in fact guilty. He was a generous and kind individual, at least according to some people who knew him, who was allegedly causing his wife to die a slow and painful death. Jim didn't always feign compassion successfully, for example, in a text conversation with his business partner's wife, where they were trying to figure out Angela's diagnosis. Jim said, quote, If it wasn't my wife, this would be kind of a fun puzzle to try to work out, unquote. It would seem as though Jim was quite proud of his ability to hide the cause of Angela's sickness and death. Item number three. As I mentioned, Jim allegedly had several affairs during his marriage to Angela. She wanted to leave him several times over the course of their 16-year relationship, but James always convinced her to remain with him. Angela was in a tough situation. Clearly, the best decision would have been to leave, but she didn't know that at the time. Jim was probably able to use his superficial charm and his manipulation abilities to keep Angela in the marriage. Item number four, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Like the notorious Chris Watts, who lived only 35 miles away from the Craig family house, Jim became wrapped up in an affair. He was obsessed with starting a new life, but Angela represented an inconvenient obstacle. He decided to kill her with poison, and he wanted to do it in a hurry. Jim lived his life in a haphazard manner. For example, he had prodigal habits. He thought that he could poison Angela, and no one would know. He made pathetic and ineffective efforts to hide his behavior, like using a new email account. Perhaps he was counting on no one questioning Angela's cause of death. Jim's obsession with his affair partner was so pronounced that even when Angela was dying, he met with his lover. He was unable to distance himself from his strong emotions. Now moving to my final thoughts. Jim was an unlikely candidate to become an alleged killer. I think this case illustrates the dangerousness of infidelity, especially when a participant is low in conscientiousness and high in extroversion. Jim Craig's infidelity compelled him to bite off more than he could chew. He tried to grin and bear it with his marriage for a while, but eventually decided to sink his teeth into homicide. His wife tried to drill down to the problem, but getting Jim to be honest was like pulling teeth. Jim could be biting cold while grinning ear to ear. He somehow thought his behavior would be as undetectable as the tooth fairy, despite the fact that he was the root of the problem. Jim was known as perpetually happy, but if he is found guilty, life in prison will wipe the smile off his face. Those are my thoughts on the case of James Craig. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.